So I'm in my workshop today, which doubles up as a potting shed. And I'm really in here to do sewing, but I thought I'd just show you what I did yesterday. So these are all the little brassicas that I'm growing for a spring harvest. And I'm experimenting with starting them much later than I would normally do. And bringing them on under grow lights because I've got quite a lot of spare grow light capacity at this time of year because my peppers, tomatoes and all that sort of thing, they don't need any grow lights obviously until sort of February time. And so I've got spare capacity. So I thought, well, rather than use up bed space for these brassicas all over winter when I could be growing winter crops, I'll clear the winter crops in sort of late February, sort of early March time and put all these uh, early brassicas in. So that's kind of the logic for all of these. And I've got dazzling blue kale, Pentland brig, uh, curly kales, uh, calabrese, marathon, spring cabbages, uh, green spring cabbages, red cabbages, uh, and a lot more red, big, much bigger red cabbages as well that I've got. Uh, that are in the greenhouse at the moment and then I've got yeah more uh, pointy green spring cabbages uh, savoy cabbages and black magic uh, Tuscan kale there and then down here on the floor I've got red ruble um, kales which I'm growing not uh, for microgreens but for sort of mini greens um, Although, of course, they've got these beautiful coppery, sort of bronzy coloured leaves. Um, so they're going to go in the house under grow lights. Um, I've got some uh, parsley. I've got some more up there. And that's going to get potted up for the windowsill in the kitchen. Um, and then I've got three uh, cauliflowers, which are my earliest cauliflowers. They're going to go in the polytunnel in... Yeah, sort of late February, uh, early March sort of time uh, for a May harvest, hopefully. And then I've got, I don't know, like probably another 10 or so cauliflowers, um, which will be for a harvest in sort of late May and early June, uh, just before the um, <sighs> melons, just before the melons go in. And then I've got another batch of little lettuces here. Um, which are going to grow under grow lights and they go under grow lights for about sort of three or four weeks and then they'll go out in the greenhouse with all the other uh, lettuces. I find that growing under grow lights to maturity doesn't go very well. Um, I just can't create the right conditions for that sort of intensity of light. Uh, so I sort of grow them until they're sort of medium sized and then let them sort of finish off in the greenhouse. So that is what I did yesterday, just potting on all of these. And now I'm gonna start sewing. Yeah, so first of all, I just wanted to show you these little uh, parsley that I started, I don't know, a couple of months ago. And I just left them in these modules for too long. And these are the um, container-wise modules, and they've got these little ribs on them which are really good for preventing the plants getting overly root bound. And hopefully you can see on this how nice these roots are. So they're not too tangled up. You can see they've grown straight sort of down the sides here. And, you know, they're re reasonably sort of loose. And uh, yeah, I'm just really happy with these root systems. I'm just going to put, you know, four of these just in this pot, just to pot on the, on the kitchen windowsill. Um, and obviously they're a bit too tight together, but they're going to be harvested just over the next few weeks. Yeah, again, just really nice kind of loose root system, not all mangled together. Uh, really good. So I've just moved some stuff into the greenhouse. So I've moved some of these parsley into the greenhouse. These three, my earliest three cauliflowers, I've got loads more cauliflowers and cabbages and things like that in here. I did a video all about this stuff yesterday, so I won't dwell on it too much. But I did just want to show you what I meant about the lettuces. So when they get to about this size, I move them into the greenhouse just to sort of finish off growing. Because what I find is that I do get some tip burn on them 
when I grow them inside because it's too warm and they're growing and it's too bright and they're growing too fast. And as a result of that, they can't take enough calcium out of the compost into the tips of the leaves. And so I get tip burn. There's some ways of sort of mitigating that even inside, like blowing air over them because that increases the respiration from the leaves. And obviously, if the leaves are losing water, the roots are pulling water out of the compost and that pulls more calcium out of the compost as well. But I don't really have ventilation like that inside and I can't be bothered to set it up right now. So just finishing them off in the greenhouse where it's still reasonably light because they are getting a little bit of extra grow light time from here, just sort of three or four hours a day. That's enough. And there's a lot more airflow in the greenhouse than there is in the house. So hopefully I won't get any tip burn. First off, I just want to show you the lettuces that I'm doing. And I'll just show how I do the labels as well. So what I do is I write the variety name at the top. I write the batch number from my database um, in the middle and I write the date. And so this makes it easy, really easy for me to look it up on the computer that it's always, you know, 846 for those. And then on the back, I write the packet number that I've given all the seed packets. When I log them in my database, it just auto generates a number. So sometimes I'm doing two because I'm not sure about the germination rate from this packet. It wasn't very good last time I tried. So I'm gonna open this second packet as well. I'm gonna put these side by side and compare them. So I'm doing that as well with Canasta because that packet didn't seem to germinate very well last time I tried it. Um, so I'm sort of starting with this packet here. So that's the way I sort of try and organize my seedlings. And I've course got all the details here on my laptop of what I'm sowing, why I'm sowing it and all that sort of thing. And the why I'm sowing it's really important and all this information is available in the description down below. Uh, so you can see why I'm sowing things as well because December is not a great time to be sowing things So you really got to have a really good reason to be sowing things at this time of year unless you just want to have a bit of fun Which is a good enough reason in itself and of course I've got all this information is available on my iPhone as well And I find that just so useful when I'm down on the allotment. So uh, yeah, anyway, lots of preamble. Let's get on with some sowing. I like sowing seeds very much, so I like to get everything pre-prepared uh, so that I don't uh, have to do it all in, in one sitting. So these are the trays that I've got filled for the onions that I'm going to do. And then these are the trays that I've got filled for everything that I'm going to sow now and then prick out in a couple of weeks' time. And the compost that I'm using is Levington's Advanced seed and modular compost and the key is it's a professional growing media and it's fairly expensive it depends on the volume that you buy it in and whether you get it delivered or not but it can cost you up to sort of 20 odd pounds for a bag like this but it lasts a long time because i'm really only using it for germination and then i switch over to this one which i've been using quite a lot that one's upside down, but basically it's Erin XL and it's a peat reduced multi-purpose compost and it's about five pound a bag. So there's a big difference between the price of these two. And yeah, so once you're pricking out, I switch over to this one basically. Right, so these are the module trays that I'm going to prick out from. I've just filled them with that uh, Levington's Advanced and just pushed the compost down like that until it's about one centimetre below the level of the surface of the compost of the module tray. And then I just sprinkle the seeds. And so I'm going to start off with winter density. So I don't find winter density does very well for me actually over winter, but I really like it in spring. And uh, it's, really, it's got a really nice crunchy rib uh, and sort of good quality leaf. But the leaf quality in uh, winter is not that great. And I often find it gets stem rot when it's grown under cover. So yeah, I stick to sort of winter density for a spring crop. And you'll see a kind of recurring theme here. So the next one is Navara. 
and this is from King Seeds. Um, winter density you can get from anywhere. But Navarra is a beautiful lettuce. Uh, look at that colouring. And that was what I was growing there in the greenhouse. Um, and of course colouring just gets better and better as we go into spring. And again, I find Navarra doesn't do very well for me over winter. So again, to get it in spring, I much prefer to start it in winter and then plant it out under cover. Um, yeah, it's, it's just such a fantastic lettuce. And it, one of the things about it is it, you can pick it as a cut and come again lettuce, which I often do in summer or you can pick it uh, as a whole heart, a whole head, which I like to do in spring, because I'm very busy in spring, and so it's just a lot easier to pick whole heads. So that's Navarra. And I've got two different types of Lolo. So this is Lolo Rossa. Um, you can see from the picture there, it's really, again, really lovely. Um, I really like these Lolo lettuces. I grow quite a lot of different varieties of them some of the Salanova ones, and also a Lolo green. And I like to get mine from Seeds of Italy because you just get like loads and loads of seeds. Um, I've already got one batch of this growing and germination was really good. So uh, yeah, I'm very happy with that one. Um, I haven't tested this one over, win over winter for harvest during winter, but uh, I'm hopeful that it'll be a good one in spring. This is one of my favourite lettuces. This one does pretty well all year round, to be honest. Uh, so this is what I call Rickia. Uh, so it's a Rickia Lolo. It's just like that uh, red one. Um, but I'm growing this one and harvesting this one at the moment. It's, uh, it's really lovely in winter, but it's, you know, it's, even, better. <laughs> it's even better in spring. So I'm doing two, two of those, one for each of those seed packets to be honest you know once lettuce seed starts to um, the germination rate starts to reduce also just the sort of genetic strength of the plants also seems to be significantly reduced um, and you just get really weak seedlings and so it's not often worth kind of trying to hang on to them that's why I'm just doing this one final test and then I'll just be throwing those out. So fortunately, Alison sent me these because she's got a packet that was germinating strongly. The last batch of those did really well. So uh, yeah, get a good few of those same. But I'll save these because I really can't afford not to have canasta in my life because it's such a fantastic lettuce for spring and summer and autumn. It's rubbish in winter, but it's great for the rest of the time. And I've got this flashy bush oak, which is another of my real favorites. Uh, unfortunately, there's no pitch on here, but uh, yeah, it's, um, there's quite a few lettuces that are similar to this. Um, it's got this dark, dark seed, which is slightly unusual. Um, but Flashy Butter Oak is the best of all of the ones with the kind of mottled skin that I've tried. It's not the easiest lettuce to manage because it does tend to grow sometimes like a little bit too big. Uh, so you do have to kind of keep on picking it carefully and everything. But other than that, it's really great. So I've just got one more thing that's on my list, which is this uh, preludium, which I think alludes to the fact it's early. So it's an early Savoy cabbage and it tends to germinate at the same speed as lettuce. So I do it with my lettuces. Um, and yeah so we'll see how this does i've never grown savoys this early but yeah we really i really like savoy cabbage so 
just like red cabbage I really like it so I'm sort of pushing the envelope on this just trying to get it to grow as quickly as I can and try in multiple successions to see which one does best as you do when you sort of push in the envelope you've got to try lots of different things and see what works because there's no books to read and what I tend to then do is um, kind of hunt around in my spare seed packet box just to see if I can kind of fill in any gaps so I think what I'll just do here is I will also sow some green cabbage because I've got lots of these seeds uh, just a spring cabbage and I'll do Kentland Brig which is a, a kale uh, and I'll do Calabrese Marathon um, so I can't stand <laughs> I'm, just, I'm funny last way I can't stand to have trays empty you know just like wasted like that so I always just try and fill them up with something and always try and fill them up with something that is a little bit experimental um, since these are bonuses so so that's all done right so that's everything that I've sewn and then I just get a little bit of this compost I just want to show you it see how nice it is so yeah so I'm just gonna sprinkle that over the top and this compost pretty dry and so I am gonna have to water it quite a lot but there's no I never sieve my compost um, at any time for any reason so and it always seems to work out just fine and I never add any amendments you know so you won't see me ever using I don't know like perlite or vermiculite or anything like that some people absolutely swear by it and I think it just depends whether you've got the right conditions for seed starting I'll show you mine and uh, yeah, maybe if you can duplicate what I do then you won't need any amendments either but some people get really good results with them I think they're just sort of patching a different problem um, which they could solve by changing the way that they germinate their seedlings perhaps anyway that's how I do it and these are now going to go into a cool bedroom uh, sort of you know 16 degrees centigrade something like that and they should be fine in there okay so now I'm just gonna look at the peppers so I'm only doing one, one chili pepper this year uh, I'm gonna do Anaheim we really like Anaheim because you can pick it at you know either light green if you want a mild chili pepper or you can sort of, sort of as it's starting to go red that's a bit hotter and then when it gets sort of bright red that's really hot so you could probably do this with all peppers but this one is just really easy to see as it kind of progresses through the stages it's nice and big so it's really easy to work with and you get you know from mild to hot uh, chili peppers depending on what your needs are all from the same plant and it's really prolific and it grows outside really well uh, as well so that's Anaheim and then all the others are my first batch 25% of what I'm going to grow uh, of the early sweet peppers these are the ones that are going to go in the kitchen on the kitchen windowsill or they're going to go in the greenhouse and so I don't need very many of them so I'm probably going to sow four seeds with hope that I get two uh, germinating because obviously I can't fit that many at the greenhouse so I'm doing long yellow ringo an old favorite of mine um, I haven't got very many left because these are sort of three or four years old now 
Um, but I've now discovered that this one, Corno Gialio or whatever, Bull's Horn, I think that means in, in Italian, this is the same as this. So I will be switching over to this one because uh, you can't get hold of Long Yellow Ringo, Long Yellow Ringo anymore. And then Lemon Dream, Bright Star, and Akron, which are just all three. One is a yellow, one is an orange, and one is a red. Uh, so, yeah, that's my pepper collection for this year. I might try a few other things if I can find uh, spare seed packets and things, but I'm not buying any more this year. So I do all my peppers the same way. I don't use any heat. Uh, I don't know anything special basically. So I just lie them on the surface. I've got loads of these so I can afford to put a few extra in here. So that's the long yellow Ringo. And yeah, so one of the reasons I quite like moles is because I really like the packaging. It's foil, um, it's got these little kind of waxed paper things as well and it's got a nice seal seals closed so it's really good packaging and the bags are really big so yeah <laughs> it's a silly reason but I do like that kind of attention to detail and yeah so let me just talk about the way and why I do the peppers the way that I do them so what I do is I just put them on a windowsill that is above a radiator that doesn't get any sun or next to no sun at this time of year. So very stable temperature. So it's about sort of 20 degrees most of the time, slightly colder at night, but not a lot colder. Um, and I do just put a little cover over them um, just to keep the compost moist but nothing nothing fancy there and I take that off obviously as soon as they germinate and I never use bottom heat after that I just use the grow lights and they have like an infrared uh, LED in them as well so that is sufficient heat for them and I'm trying to grow them not too hot you know I want them to grow at about 18 degrees or something like that which is basically the temperature in an unheated bedroom with a grow light above them so otherwise I think they can get just a, you know a little bit too hot I mean they're not used to obviously growing at really high temperatures in nature uh, once they when they just germinate so I'm just trying to duplicate sort of you know their natural conditions and as soon as I can I get them out from under the grow lights into natural light which tends to be about March and then I can sort of move them into the conservatory and uh, and just give them natural light there and I'm only doing, as I said, 25% of my total. Because, and so my rationale is that these that I'm doing right now, these are the ones that will eat fresh nice and early. And then the next batch, which I'll do at the beginning of February, uh, those, that's another 25%. That's the next batch, again, that will focus on eating fresh. Uh, and they'll go into a low tunnel on the allotment after something like spinach or something like that. Cal Calabrese or something. Um, and that's kind of the f focus for our fresh eating, is these first two batches. Uh, and then we'll switch over to the batch that we sow in late February and they're the ones that we're going to be you know using to make passatas, ketchups, 
um, you know, various sort of sources and things, as well as freezing. Um, and yeah, so they're the kind of ones for storage, basically. Oh, well, obviously, still eat a few of those fresh, but we don't need those storage, that storage crop, until August. So our objective is this batch will be eating in sort of June, early July, and then keep on eating it, obviously, all through until October time. And then the, uh, the next batch will be eating in sort of July, early August. Uh, and then the final batch will be eating in sort of you know, late August, September, October, or, or storing in that sort of time scale. The reason I do it that way is just comes down to space. You know, that uh, otherwise I end up with far too many peppers cluttering up uh, the conservatory and sort of hogging my grow lights uh, when I really don't need them. <laughs> I just don't need them all to come in July. I'd much rather to get a nice sort of staggered harvest. So anyway, that's the way I do my peppers. And then again, just lightly covering these. I also don't bother with things like watering them with warm water and things like that. Um, I just use water straight out of the tap. Because water from the tap, um, the first draw of water, which is what I'm tend to be using it, that is about room temperature anyway. So uh, yeah, that's fine. So next up, I've got these early peas. So these are going to go in a container in the, not the conservatory, in the greenhouse. And I didn't have the greenhouse in time to do them any earlier than this. So I'm just going to pop a few in here. Um, I don't know how well they're going to germinate, but I'll just push them down. And so they should give us a nice early harvest, early May. And then I'll start some more in January, which are slightly slower growing than this batch, uh, than this variety rather. And they'll be ready towards the end of May. But it's nice to have some in the garden for the grandkids to sort of munch on when they come racing around the garden. So that's the peas. So I don't need very many, obviously, because they're just going in a single container. Right, so then we've got the onions. And I've already firmed this compost down nicely. And so I, I don't really recommend doing main crop onions early. Um, you know, some people will do it and some people will have success, I'm sure. But I just find that by far the most reliable time to do your main crop onions, the ones you don't want to take any risk with at all, is the middle of February. And there's plenty of time for them to grow and get good size. Um, you don't probably want them to be too big anyway because big onions don't store as well as smaller onions. So why am I doing onions now? Well, I'm doing salad onions and I'm choosing varieties of salad onions that can be left to bulb up if you find that you haven't, that you've got too many, which sometimes happens. You know, if your overwintered salad onions are really successful, then yeah, you can end up with too many, but then, you know, when you want to take a risk, or I don't want to take a risk of being without salad onions for any week of the year. So these are a hedge. And, but it is nice to have that sort of option that if you don't need them, you can just leave them. And so I'm, normally I'll do eight salad onions in a module. Um, but because I'm sort of growing these as a option 
to leave for a sort of early harvest ideally in probably you know the beginning of July something like that I'm only going to do about six or something like that it just makes thinning them down to three or four a little bit easier it's a little bit tricky I think to thin a bunch of eight down without sort of damaging the the rest of the onions so yeah so this variety is Lilia and it's a beautiful purple variety and absolutely brilliant in spring although I'm picking them right now and they're pretty good as well uh, in winter so far so I don't overly worry about getting everything perfect in terms of quantities when I'm doing onions because as I say I can always thin them down to the right density and then the other one I'm doing is North Holland Blood Red So one of the th issues you've got when you start something as early as this is you are significantly increasing the likelihood that they will go to seed on you in uh, early summer, or midsummer even. Uh, so that is not a problem if you're growing them to eat in summer anyway, which I am. So either spring if I'm picking them as a salad on you, or summer if I decide to leave them. So, but if you are growing them as your main crop, then you're also increasing the risk that your main crop's going to go to seed on you. And since your main crop is primarily being grown for storage, well, in my case it is anyway, I really don't want to take the risk that uh, they might go to seed on me. So anyway, that's my logic. So I'm not going to do anything with these now. I'm not going to prick them out or anything like that. I'll just grow them in the modules and then sometime in sort of late February, early March time, I will be uh, planting these out. So now I'm going to do a green variety, exactly the same logic here. So it's a bulbin variety that just happens to taste really nice when picked as a salad onion. And that is stir on. And, but I'm going to do loads of these, so I'm going to do a full tray of these. And I've already got my overwintered onions in and growing quite happily. And those are tough ball. And they're the ones we're going to be picking in sort of late May, June sort of time, depending on how quickly our main crop onions run out. It's the same story here in terms of quantities. Again, I'm just doing about six, and I'll thin them down to about three if I decide to keep them. So when it comes to germinating these, again, I'm just going to germinate these uh, in a cool bedroom and sort of again sort of similar sort of temperature well same temperature that i mentioned before sort of 16 degrees or thereabouts and then they need to go under light but they don't want too much heat so they're going to go in the greenhouse just with that little bit of extra grow light supplement so that they think they're growing in march so look that actually more like late February right now. So late February, March, which is kind of my ideal onion sowing time. So they they think that they're being grown at the optimum time. And so they'll just I'll keep them 
at that level, thinking they're in sort of perpetual March um, until they get planted out in March. And then just March kind of continues. And as a result, you know, they don't get confused about what's going on. Um, they just seem think they're growing naturally, just a, a long March. Right, so now I'm doing my leeks. Now again, I don't really recommend doing leeks at this time of year. It's way too early. But if you want leeks to eat in summer, then you do have to start them just a little bit earlier than you would otherwise, but only the number that you need to eat in the first two or three weeks, basically, of harvest. So I'll do another batch in January and they'll be the ones that I'm eating uh, in sort of, well, so hopefully I'll be harvesting these in July, early July, and then towards the end of July, the ones that I start in January will be ready. Um, and I'll eat those through July and August, and then the, uh, the batch that I start in February will be ready. Um, and it just goes on like that until I do my main crop leeks towards the end of March, early April, uh, to be planted out in July. So, yeah, these will need a bit of protection when they're planted out, and they'll need a little bit of extra light. Again, it's the same sort of story. We want them to think that they're growing in March, um, and they'll be in here until I... Uh, decide to plant them out probably in this pot. So there's not very many in there, it's about 20 probably, um, or about 20 will germinate anyway. I'll probably put a few more than that in there. And these are leek, the variety is Hillary, or yeah, Hillary. Um, and I've just used multi-purpose compost in here, but I'm just covering them with the seed compost because I don't want to waste the seed starting compost on these in this big pot. And also the multi-purpose compost got a little bit more feed in, the, in it, so we'll just feed them for a little bit longer. And I'll say I'll be planting these out under cover. So that's the leeks. So when I'm doing Asian greens, I'm doing them in seed starting compost and I always firm this down. I did see somebody the other day saying, well, you we don't want to firm it down too much. Well, I don't really think with compost, it's very spongy. Uh, I don't think you can firm it down too much. I don't worry about that. I think the objective, especially when you're using these container-wise modules, is to make sure that uh, they're really firm so there's plenty of compost in the modules, good water retaining capability, and the modules come out nice and clean out of the module cells. And uh, yeah, plenty of nutrients, all that. There's just loads of benefits of making sure they're nice and firm in here. So I'll just firm them in again gently this time because I do need to be able to press my fingers in to make uh, a depression for sewing. There we go and then just one more handful should be enough. Right so I'm doing a lot of I've got a lot of Asian greens in the ground at the moment uh, but they always go to seed on me in late winter. So ideally I want this batch ready to for harvest by the end of February, hence doing them now. So I would just make the depressions with my finger. And I'm just pushing in about a centimetre. And I find that actually is pretty much the right depth for almost everything. Um, you know, even the celery uh, and things like people talk about growing it on the surface, 
And actually I find it seems to benefit from being slightly covered in, uh, in compost. But, you know, this myth that seems to exist that says that you should plant a seed twice its, a depth that's twice its size, you know, maybe that works for squash or something like that. But uh, yeah, it definitely doesn't work, for example, for a lettuce seed, which is much better off a centimetre down. Uh, and all everything in the brassica family, again, is sort of a centimetre down. And you would be planting them like a millimetre down <laughs> if you use the twice its size rule. That's way too shallow for them. So yeah, <laughs> this is a slow process on video. So I actually normally uh, prick out my uh, Asian greens, but I think this time I'm going to multi-sow them because I want, primarily I want them for uh, a harvest of baby greens. So I'm gonna do two in each module, well, obviously sometimes three will fall in and I won't bother about that. Because I really like the Komatsuma in my salad mixes. I mean, it's okay growing bigger with a nice big crunchy stem for say a stir fry or something, a soup or something like that. But uh, obviously, you know, you can leave a few to grow like that. But I think primarily for me now we're growing mostly for baby greens um, and doing a lot of the Komatsuma because that seems to be one of the nicer ones. It's boring in colour, it's just green but uh, yeah I've just I've been really enjoying it, it this winter in my salads. And then the next one I'm doing is the red stem pack drawing, which is deceivingly named because actually the leaves are red as well. It's not just the stem. And again, lots of these going in. So I get lots of little baby leaf. So two per module there. And then we've got the tatsoi. This doesn't lend itself to uh, baby leaf. Um, and I'm doing two varieties, not two varieties, two different seed packets here, uh, because again, I'm not quite sure of the viability of one of them. So that's, right. yeah, so the tatsoi, you know, it's best left really, I think, to grow as an individual plant um, and you get lots of lovely baby leaves off it anyway, so that's fine. But what I will do is I will just put by a couple of uh, seeds in one or two of these modules, just in case I, I get some that don't germinate. Uh, and then I can just prick out the spares just to fill in any gaps there. And that's the technique that I always use whenever I'm growing, so, growing, whenever I'm sowing direct into a module, I'll always just put a couple of spares in. And then I'll leave all these seeds since I've got them all sorted out uh, in the uh, potting shed because I'll be re-sowing a lot of these in January, depending on how well this batch does. You know, because as I said, some of them might not germinate very well because some of them are slightly old seed packets and all of that sort of thing. And I don't want to have to sort of go through my seed store and find them all again. Right, finished. And then nobody will be surprised to know that uh, I have a vacuum cleaner in here and uh, give it a bit of a tidy up and move it from 
potting shed mode into workshop mode again and I need to get these watered and there was a time when I used to really fuss over watering in my seedlings but now I find it's just really easy to do it with the hose pipe and I just leave them to drain on there for half an hour or so. 